here we have this Bible, and I don't know what your individual background is, but a lot of us, there's a lot of guilt attached to this book. Guilt from not reading it. Guilt like I was supposed to do my devotional time. There was a Roman emperor earlier on named Diocletian, and Diocletian had said, if you are carrying certain books, uh, certain letters, which were what we have as the New Testament, then you will be put to death. No other author have I ever seen who writes a book with the only intention of having an intimate relationship with every single reader. The first 400 years of church history, it wasn't until 396 where they got together and decided on the table of contents for the Bible. They already had the Old Testament because of the Jewish people before them, but they hadn't decided which books to keep for the New Testament yet. There were a lot of false Gnostic things floating around that they had to decide to keep or discard. Um, fortunately, they had a good test for that. There was a Roman emperor earlier on named Diocletian, and Diocletian had said, if you are carrying certain books, uh, certain letters, uh, which were what we have as the New Testament, then you will be put to death. So the emperor put out this decree, and there were Christians that were dying for those letters and protecting them. But nobody was dying for that Gnostic silliness. Nobody was dying for the Da Vinci Code. You hear me? Just Tom Hanks. But... You know. <laughs> So they knew pretty well which books they really believed were divinely inspired. So they put this, put this together at the Council of Nicaea and decide these are the books that we are going to consider canon, that we're going to say these are divinely inspired authority. And those books are what we actually have as our New Testament and our Old Testament together. So, um, and I, I, could, I could rabbit trail on that, but I'll, I'll leave that there for now. Um, the, so the first quarter of church history, we didn't even have the table of contents figured out. Then you move for about a thousand years of people who have a literacy rate that's in the single digits of communities. The only people that are literate are the lawyers, the priests, um, very specific academics. And so during that whole time period, you have this very heavy religious environment because the only people that can read the book is the priest that's been trained and sent from Rome. And so he can come in and say whatever he wants to because there's no check and balance in that system. So you have this mess for a long time, and you get to about the 1300s, and you have John Wycliffe, and John Wycliffe uh, puts his life on the line to translate the Bible into a common language. And yet, keep in mind, there is no printing press, so he is by hand writing and translating the Bible. I don't know if you've ever seen any of these Bibles. I, I was in Germany a year ago, and they were doing a display in this giant old church, and you could see them, and they looked like they were printed because the handwriting was unbelievable. It's an amazing work that they did. And so he translates it, and then you move another 200 years, and you get to the Gutenberg printing press, and Martin Luther translates the Bible into the common language of the Germans, and so... Uh, they, they publish that, and it's the first published book in history on the Gutenberg printing press is the Bible. So it starts being printed, and it starts being published, and now the Bible's finally starting to get out to the common person. Literacy is starting to increase. At this time, they actually take Bibles, and they, they would make one, and you as an individual would not have a Bible. Your town would have a Bible. And your pastor or priest in the town would have that Bible in the pulpit, chained to the pulpit. 
These were called pulpit Bibles. They were literally chained to the pulpit. And the pastor or priest would be the one who would go and with the candle and just read and read and read at his pulpit and study the pulpit Bible. And so we move a bit further in church history. We get to the 1800s, and now Bibles are becoming more uh, ubiquitous. They're getting out. Everybody's getting hold of one. It's wonderful. Literacy is going way up. We get people like uh, James Strong, who writes the Strong's Concordance. Can you imagine writing the first concordance? Oh, my gosh. I don't even know if you've all used one, but if you had a, a Strong's, you know, the thing was the size of a telephone book. I don't know if you've ever used a telephone book, but <laughs> it's sort of like a blockbuster. Um, or a Saturn. I know you used to have a Saturn. <laughs> that was for you, Annie. <laughs> so this, this James Strong, I mean, if you think about this, he has to go through the Bible and pull out every use of the word the, the, thou, thine, th thy, and, you know, and shalt. Oh, my goodness. Right? Every single usage and puts it all in in that glossary of the, of the concordance. Years, years and years and years of work. Now you can punch it in on any app, right? And so you got it. You got your concordance, and it's better, and it's improved, and all of that. But for 100 years, it is the standard, is a, is a concordance. A strong concordance is one of the best. You get... Um, lexicons, and you get Vine's expository dictionary, and Mounts's, and the way that these things are written are, are years and decades of work that go into study to put this stuff together. So here we are, we arrive now, present day, and we think, well, what we understand about the Bible is what everybody understands about the Bible and has always understood about the Bible. If you get a better view of church history, the more reality is only in the last 100, maybe 200 years at the most, would an average common person have a Bible and have the ability to read it and to have the level of tools and access and the ability to dig, we should be finding some new understandings. The foundation is the same. It is the inspired authority. It is divinely inspired in its writing. That's still the same. But our understanding of it should be changing, should be growing. And if that isn't happening, you can make a New Year's resolution. We'll give you a couple extra days. Um, but it should be. It should be challenged. It should be shaken. It should be growing. And if it's not growing then at some point, something, something registered and said, I, I've, I've learned enough, I think I understand it, I think I grasp it, good enough. Or any new information, now we're a little resistant to it. Anybody feel that sometimes? No, thank you. I appreciate the no, I, thank you. But that's, that's where many of us are, is that Ah, I don't know. I never heard it before, so I don't think it could be true. Um, okay. But where I started with this thought is the guilt that we have about not reading it. You've only had the ability, the privilege, to have the access to it in the last couple generations the last few generations to have that. And we've gotten to the point now where it is such a requirement that there comes a level of a trick, I believe, from the enemy to bring shame and condemnation and guilt on us for not sitting down and reading it every single day. Well, the challenge here I would, I would put forth is what if we grew in our understanding of it not just our repetition of reading it with the same understanding. Right. 
I believe, you know, there's, there's, it's not about like Father, Son, and the Bible. I mean, it's, it's not a part of the Trinity, okay? So I, I don't mean to just talk about that and leave out, like, let me mention Jesus, okay? Jesus. <laughs> I talked a lot about the Bible. So yes, Jesus, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, absolutely love, honor the presence, connect with their hearts, but they've also given us a way to get to know them. If it weren't for this, you wouldn't know anything about Jesus. So it's not either or. It's not one over the other. It's not, it, I mean, he's the author. But think about this. No other author have I ever seen who writes a book with the only intention of having an intimate relationship with every single reader. That's pretty cool. Hmm. So he's got a whole different goal in mind. And I believe that through what he put in this for us, you'll know the truth, the truth will set you free. So this will help us heal marriages, heal physical bodies, heal mental states of depression, tormenting thoughts, uh, demonic oppression. This, This is not separate from the Holy Spirit. He works with it. He works through it. It's a conduit that he partners with. As he's partnering with you, it changes your identity. This is not boring. And it's not an obligation. And it's not a burden. It's a privilege. And as we approach it with the idea of a different question, instead of this question of, do I have to? if we can approach it with a fresh question of what can I get from this? And not in a narcissistic way, but in a, I know that there's life in here. I know there's life that can be mined from this. If I fall in love with this, there's so much that I can, I can receive from this. <laughs> 